We're going to read Matthew chapter 14, verse 13 to 21. That's Matthew 14, 13 to 21. Starting in verse 13. When Jesus heard it, he departed from there by boat to a deserted place by himself. But when the multitudes heard it, they followed him on foot from the cities. And when Jesus went out, he saw a great multitude and he was moved with compassion for them and healed their sick. When it was evening, his disciples came to him saying, this is a deserted place and the hour is already late. Send the multitudes away that they may go into the villages and buy themselves food. But Jesus said to them, they do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. And they said to him, we have here only five loaves and two fish. He said, Bring them here to me. Then he commanded the multitudes to sit down on the grass, and he took the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up to heaven, he blessed and broke and gave the loaves to the disciples, and the disciples gave to the multitudes. So they all ate and were filled, and they took up twelve baskets full of the fragments that remained. Now those who had eaten were about five thousand men, besides women and children." Thank you, Devin. Thank you, Katie and musicians. And good morning, church family. I'll echo that. It is good to come together. It is good to be together. And especially good when we can come together to worship the Lord. Um, I want to give special greetings to those of you who are joining us by live stream, particularly our home church groups as you meet in your homes today. I'm going to be uh, sharing a, a personal testimony as part of my message this morning, but I encourage those of you uh, at home group to uh, take some time to share maybe some of your testimonies as well. And uh, for the rest of us, we have a, a potluck following. That would be a great time for some of you to share some of the things the Lord is doing in your life. I encourage that. So, Father, we thank you for bringing us together. Thank you for making us um, children of you, family of God. What a privilege, Lord. We thank you for that. And thank you for the transformation that you have made and are making in each of our lives as we have yielded to you and trusted you with our lives. And, Lord, those who trust you will not be ashamed, is your promise, and we thank you for that. Thank you for the glorious truths we've been singing about this morning, and we thank you that we have a God who is worthy of our praise and a God who gives us much to sing about and to rejoice in. And so, Lord, as we look at your word this morning, we ask you to enable us to understand it. I pray, Father, that you would fill my mouth with your words, that you would speak through me, that you would um, accomplish in your church your purpose for your church. Lord, let your will be done. Let your name be glorified. And let your people rejoice and delight in you, for you are an awesome God. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. As I study uh, through the Bible, uh, particularly these days, uh, I am always watching for what the Lord would show us from his word to instruct us on how we are to live in these days. And I am studying it with the confidence and the conviction that God has equipped the church with everything that we need for the task at hand. In Christ, we have everything that we need for life and godliness, but often we don't understand what we have in Christ and what came with the package when we embraced our salvation. And so this morning, we're going to be uh, focusing on some of that as we look at a familiar passage of Scripture uh, with Jesus feeding the 5,000. 
Um, I think we're going to see when we come to the end that, yes, Jesus did feed the 5,000, but actually it was through the disciples. And we're going to see that the, five, the disciples fed the 5,000 in response to the direction of the Lord, um, but by the power of his Holy Spirit. So in chapter 11, just to give us a little bit of background here, Jesus gave a severe warning to the crowds of people living in the cities of Chorazin, Bethsaida, and Capernaum, saying that they were going to face more severe judgment uh, or punishment in the day of judgment than the people of Sodom because they had witnessed so many miracles and had heard so much teaching, but they were not repentant of their sins, and they refused to believe in what Jesus was telling them, particularly about himself. And chapter 12 was uh, about the opposition of the Pharisees and the religious leaders to Jesus' teaching and his miracles and accusing him of functioning in the power of the demons. Chapter 12 concluded with Jesus being rejected by his hometown, rejected by his own relatives. Then in chapter 13, Jesus began uh, speaking in parables so that the crowds would not understand the meaning of his teaching. And then in private, uh, when he had them alone, he would explain it to his disciples. But because of the hardness of the people's hearts towards the word of God, Jesus was uh, speaking to them in parables. Then chapter 14 opened with Jesus' cousin, John the Baptist, being executed in prison because he spoke the uncomfortable truth about Herod's sin. Now, all of these events in which the people of Israel were rejecting Jesus and rejecting his message triggered the postponement of the establishment of the kingdom of God on earth. Uh, the pause button was pushed on establishing the kingdom. The offer of the kingdom was withdrawn. And in our last study, we left off with Jesus having just received information about John the Baptist having been executed by Herod. And when he heard this news, the rejected king slipped away by boat to find a quiet place away from all these problem people. And so we pick up the story, Matthew chapter 14 and verse 13. When Jesus heard it, heard that report of John's execution, he departed from there by boat to a deserted place by himself. Jesus was not trying to get away from his disciples, for uh, he had them with him in the boat, becomes apparent very soon here. But he wanted to get away from the crowds. He wanted to get away from the people in part because of the news that he'd heard from John, of, of John's um, assassination, his murder, and in part because of just the, the constant rejection of the people. He was taking time off. But when the multitudes heard it, they followed him on foot from the cities. Because it seems that uh, Jesus was ministering in Capernaum, the last part of uh, these last chapters, his ministry has been largely in Capernaum, and so he seems to be leaving from the city of Capernaum, these multitudes would largely then include the same unrepentant people from Capernaum and the nearby cities of Chorazin and Bethsaida, uh, whom Jesus had warned of severe judgment back in chapter 11. As John 6.27 tells us, most of these people did not seek Jesus because they believed his teaching, but because they were attracted to the miracles. And at this point, we would expect that Jesus would not have anything to do with the unbelieving crowds. But surprisingly, unlike me, instead of rejecting the people, instead of saying to his disciples, People are there, let's go this way. Um, he had compassion on the people when they came to him with their needs. They were not deserving, but he was merciful and very gracious. Verse 14, and when Jesus went out, he saw a great multitude, and he was moved with compassion for them and healed their sick. 
Now, I don't know about you, but I find this amazing. Under these circumstances, that Jesus would be moved with compassion for these people, and even more amazing, that he would heal their sick. This is an encouraging example if you feel that you are unworthy of God uh, ministering into your life. How often do we hesitate to ask him and our hearts are filled with doubt to ask because uh, we just feel, oh, he would never do that for me, especially the way my week has gone or the way I've been lately. And, and it's this legalistic mindset that comes over us that somehow we must be worthy, become worthy of God blessing us. But God often blesses most the most undeserving. And Jesus came into this world to live as a man. It's something we have uh, drawn attention to again and again in our study. He came to live as God originally intended mankind to live, to live the perfect human life, and to model how New Testament children of God are called to live, are invited to live. Jesus Christ is our supreme example of a Christian. And as the Holy Spirit of God lived through Jesus when he walked this world, so the Holy Spirit still desires to live through the church, which is the body of Christ in the world. That is our calling to let Christ live his life through us. That is the Christian life. Let Jesus express his life through you as you yield to him, as you trust in him. Charles Spurgeon said that the history of Christ's life is a pattern and example for the history of his church. As Jesus healed the sick, so is the church to carry on a great healing ministry throughout the world through his spirit that lives in us. Now, the passage we are studying today was part of the Lord's training of his disciples. He's, he's training his disciples for the ministry which he was preparing them for. And they would be sent into all the world where they would face multitudes of lost and needy people. Jesus is sending them out, but he's not sending them out powerless. The task might seem impossible in its magnitude, but Christ has given his followers the same Holy Spirit who empowered him. He lived as a man, though he was God, but he limited himself to living and acting as a man in total dependence upon the power of the Holy Spirit. So everything you read about Jesus doing in the Bible, he did as a man, though he was God, and he never stopped being God. And so the task may seem impossible, but Christ has given us everything that is needed to do it. Let us pray as a congregation that the Lord would increase our own understanding and increase our faith in God's provision of supernatural ministry for the church today. Uh, just a week ago, I was at a, a pastor's conference at River's Edge Camp, and I spoke with a young man from India who had just arrived in Canada last spring. His dad is a pastor in India. And at one point in our congregation, I was intrigued with, with the things he was telling me about the church in India. And I asked him what differences, apart from cultural, he noticed between the church in Canada and the church in India. And right away, he responded and said that in India, it is very a very common occurrence for people to experience miraculous healings when the church prays for them. And he said it is common in India for, uh, for churches to pray for the lame and they walk, the blind to see and they see, and pray for the deaf and they hear, pray for the deliverance of demons and they flee. But rarely does he see any supernatural miracles in the church in Canada. And I asked him if he could explain why this difference. 
And he said, he's just getting to know us and he's not sure, but he thinks it seems to be because Canadians trust so much in science, but Indians believe in the supernatural. Now I've shared with you how I am on a personal journey of prayer and searching God's word for a greater understanding of the role of healing in the ministry of the church. And I've been praying much for uh, deliverance from a medication that I have been taking in increasingly strong doses for many years to treat an enlarged prostate. And my doctor has me on a waiting list uh, to see a specialist about surgery. And I have tried unsuccessfully over the years to reduce my dosage. Uh, it's really been bothering me increasingly that I am so dependent upon pharmaceutical but I could never go more than two or three days at a reduced dosage without experiencing serious symptoms and I had to revert back to full dose. But last month, through a series of events, as I prayed, the Lord very strongly impressed upon my heart that I was to stop my medication and trust him to heal me. And for the first few days, I suffered all the symptoms and saw no sign of healing, and much fear began gripping my heart. But God strongly impressed upon my heart that I was to continue trusting him. And the symptoms began to subside, and I have now gone 36 days with no medication, and I now have no symptoms, and I haven't felt this comfortable in years. I praise the Lord. I believe that the Lord has supernaturally healed me, and I thank him for that. Um, my next doctor's appointment is going to be interesting. <laughs> and I'm praying for, for God to use me in that occasion. But I agree with Charles Spurgeon. I believe that the Lord is encouraging me in my exploration of, of this and through that experience of healing, I believe he is nudging me to continue in this direction. And Charles Spurgeon um, said that Jesus was setting the pattern for the church to follow in our, his attitude of compassion and in his ministry of healing. And Jesus is modeling for us how to live the Christian life. We have so often reduced the Christian life to a Sunday morning gathering involving the singing of songs and the preaching of the word and some fellowship. But beyond that, what is there to the Christian life? For many people, we don't really know. But Jesus is modeling for us a life that is from day to day involved in the lives of need, needy people, ministering to their needs. And I confess that I have a lot to learn Many things I don't understand, and some things that I believe that we need to learn from the church in India, and probably from churches in many parts of the world. In verse 15, when it was evening, his disciples came to him, saying, This is a deserted place, and the hour is already late. Send the multitudes away, that they may go into the villages and buy themselves food. Like Jesus' disciples, isn't our tendency to, to send the needy people to the world's professionals, to find help in the world for their needs? We send the sick to the doctors, and, and there is an important place for the doctors, and I thank the Lord for them. And we send the hungry to the food banks, and thank God for the food banks. But did you know that most food banks and drop-in shelters and soup kitchens used to be run by the church? And the church has, in many parts of the world throughout the history of the church, been the go-to place for healing when there was desperate need. And according to the Bible, not according to our tradition, ask the question, what is the role of the church towards needy and suffering people, according to the Bible? In verse 16, after the disciples have said 
Lord, it's getting late. Send the multitudes away to the villages so they can buy themselves food. Jesus said to them, they do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. In the original Greek, you give is emphatic. It is you, yes, you give them something to eat. It's important to notice that Jesus uh, had given a clear instruction to his disciples what follows was not them acting presumptuously, um, but they were following God's direction. Like when I stopped taking my medication, God was clearly impressing upon my heart to do that. Now, the primary purpose of our existence is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. That's, that's our primary purpose in life, to glorify God and enjoy him. But we could do that in heaven. So why are we here on this polluted earth? Why are we stuck here? Lord, just take us home to enjoy you and, and glorify you. Uh, why are we here? And his purpose for having us here is so many lost and hungry souls can uh, come to know the love of Jesus by seeing him compassionately ministering to their needs through us. We are here for the sake of the lost who do not yet know Christ. And the crowds of lost people all around us are the reason that we're not in heaven yet today. Let's not waste our lives looking after ourselves. Our purpose is to be looking outward and looking upward. Our mission is to minister to the needy of this world in the name of Jesus Christ and in the power of his Holy Spirit, putting no confidence in ourselves but trusting him. And we've been studying how Jesus worked in the power of the Holy Spirit to fulfill the work that his Father had sent him to do, to preach the gospel to the poor, to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, and to set at liberty those who are oppressed. But what we often fail to grasp is the significance of Jesus' words in John 14, 12. Turn with me to John 14, verse 12. As part of his teaching and training of his disciples, Jesus said these words to them. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also, and greater works than these he will do, because I go to my Father. May the Lord burn into our hearts the truths of these words. Jesus' work was all about ministering to the needs of the people in the power of the Holy Spirit, and this is now our mission, to function as the body of Christ. And what does that look like? Back in Matthew chapter 14, verse 17, verse 16, Jesus has said, you don't need to send them away, you feed them. Verse 17, and they said to him, we have here only five loaves and two fish. Now, keep in mind that there are thousands of people in the crowd. Why would the disciples even mention that they had five loaves and two fish? Now, their loaves were these little flat pita loaves. It wasn't a big loaf that could maybe feed a couple of families. No, it was uh, five loaves would maybe feed two or three people. So why even mention this? Now, first of all, they are understanding the fact that there is absolutely no way that they can meet this need uh, with their own resources. We can't do it, is what they're saying. But the fact that they even mention the few loaves and fishes reveals that among them there is a mustard-sized faith that perhaps Jesus can do something with this. Jesus, we have five loaves and two fish. Now, we can't do anything about, with that, but 
maybe you can. Uh, Mark chapter 12 and verse 41. We have a passage that we can learn a little bit of information from this that helps us interpret the passage we're looking at in Matthew. Mark chapter 12, verse 41 Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put. This was at the the temple treasury in Jerusalem. And he watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. Many rich people threw in large amounts, but a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins worth only a few cents. Calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, Truly, I tell you, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. They all gave out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in everything, all she had to live on. Now, the interesting part of that is Jesus said she put in more than all the others. What can God do with a little when it is all we have and we give it to him. Well, let's go back to Matthew 14 and see. Verse 18. Jesus said, bring them here to me. Bring me those five loaves and two fish. And then he commanded the multitudes to sit down, and literally the word is commanded them to recline or lie down on the grass And he took the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up to heaven, he blessed and broke and gave the loaves to the disciples, and the disciples gave to the multitudes. Now, this scene is taking place on the shore of Galilee, and this is a direct parallel with the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, he makes me lie down in green pastures. Jesus told them to lie down, recline on the grass. He leads me beside the still waters. The still waters of Galilee were right there beside them as they're reclining on the grass. And Jesus has just finished healing their sick. He anoints my head with oil. And he is about to feed them, but he is showing himself to be their good shepherd. And he took the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up to heaven, he blessed them. Now, Jesus held those limited natural resources in his hand, but that wasn't his focus. He lifted his eyes up off of that which could not meet the need, and he looked up to the, the only one who could meet the need, and he blessed the food. In other words, he thanked God for the food and prayed that it would be a blessing to the people. His act of giving thanks was acknowledgement of the complete sufficiency of the Father to meet the people's need in an impossible situation, and he thanked God for who he was and what he was going to do. A key to living the Christian life is described in Colossians 3.17, and whatever you do in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Uh, We could spend some more time on this giving thanks, and it's in John's gospel, uh, John identifies the giving of thanks was the key part of what happened here. Uh, It was the memorable part of what happened. Uh, We focus on the, the multiplying. John focused on the giving thanks, but we'll go on. Verse 19 goes on to say, He blessed and broke and gave the loaves to the disciples, and the disciples gave to the multitudes. What did he give the disciples? They gave him five loaves, two fish, He blessed them, broke them, and gave them back to the disciples. Five loaves, two fish. How much food would it take to feed this many people? Now, I have fun when I'm studying something like this. I just pause and I try. I was tempted to call Daryl and Tammy and ask, you know, how much food would it take to feed (laughs) 5,000? 
Well, verse 21 tells us that there were about 5,000 men, the big eaters, besides women and children who also ate. Now, assuming that there were equal men and women, there would have been 10,000 adults, not 5,000, 10,000 adults. Now, there were also children, uh, but likely not everyone brought their kids along. So let's say conservatively that there were twice as many adults as children. So 10,000 adults, 5,000 children, you've got a conservative total of 15,000 people. Now, verse 20 tells us that they all ate and were filled. And so for simple math, let's say that an On average, they all ate the equivalent of a quarter-pounder hamburger. Is it really a quarter-pounder? I don't know. I've never weighed it. But for math's sake, a quarter-pounder hamburger. Each one, on average, ate a quarter-pounder hamburger. 15,000 quarter-pounders. How much would that weigh? Uh, 3,750 pounds of food, or 1,700 kilos. That's almost two tons of food. This would, take, this, this would fill a U-Haul truck. Now, according to the text, Jesus did not give his disciples 3,750 pounds of bread and fish to pass out. It says he distributed back to them the broken pieces of five loaves of bread and presumably also the two fish to his disciples. It doesn't even say that he gave them 12 baskets full of bread to start with. But it seems likely that what he did was he put these broken pieces of five loaves and two fish into the bottom of 12 baskets and gave each one of them a basket. Now remember what he said in verse 16, you give them something to eat. Now, what's he just done? He's prayed over the food. He's blessed it. And he's given it back to the disciples and said, go with it. And um, here the Lord required his disciples to take a step of faith. They were given just a small amount of food and assigned to go out among perhaps 15,000 hungry people and feed them. All the disciples could see, as they look in their basket, was these few pieces of bread, few pieces of fish. But they stepped out in faith and started to give those away, and that seems to be when the miracle happened. It was as the disciples stepped out, began reaching in their basket and handing out the fragments that they had been given that more appeared in their basket and more and more. And the multiplication of the food was taking place in their own hands as they were distributing. Indeed, they were giving the people something to eat as Jesus had instructed them to. But as they were doing so, they were very aware, this isn't us. This is God working through us. This is God doing something amazing as we just step out in obedience to his word and trust him. And no matter how much they gave out, there were always more pieces in their basket. And I can picture they would be shaking some out to a father here for your family and your kids. You, you distribute it. And, and they were giving generously. Like the widow in 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 12, who during a severe famine had only a handful of flour in a bin and a little oil in a jar, and she was on her way home to make one last pita bread for herself and her son before they died of starvation. But Elijah the prophet challenged her if she would first make a small loaf for him that God promised she would have enough left over for her and her son, and that the bin of flour shall not be used up, nor shall the jar of oil run dry until the famine comes to an end. That was God's word to this widow. And yet she had a handful of flour and a little bit of oil in her jar, enough to make just enough for her and her son. But she trusted God's word, 
She fed Elijah first, and there was still more left over for her family, and her flour and oil never ran out, and she was able to feed Elijah and her family bread for many days until the famine was over. We see the same thing happening here with the, the loaves and the fish. They could just keep giving out and giving out, out of this little amount, and it never ran out. When the Lord asks us to trust him in an act of obedience, he often doesn't reveal to us more than one step at a time. He asks us to go, but all we see is this little bit, and we look beyond, and we say, this will never meet the need. This isn't enough. He says, just go. Trust me. But we must take that first step of faith and obedience before he will reveal the next step. When we don't sense God's power and we don't see his provision, it can be very difficult to step out in obedience to his word. Perhaps you feel that you can't afford to open up your home in hospitality to others the way God is prompting you to. Do you fear that if you're going to give your meager resources to someone in need that you will not have enough for yourself? Are we afraid to trust God for something that he is calling us to because we can't see how it would ever work or could work? But if we refuse to step out in faith because we see no evidence of the miracle up front and we are afraid that it will fail, and we will look foolish. I've had that fear often. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look stupid. And so we hold back. Then we will likely experience nothing of God's mighty power working through our lives. Matthew 8, 13. Then Jesus said to the centurion, Go your way, and as you have believed, so let it be done for you. And his servant was healed that very same hour. As you have believed, so let it be done for you. When you can't see very far ahead, go as far as you can see, and you will be able to see more. That's God's principle. Give and you will receive. But it starts with giving what you've got. And then the more comes in. Well, God, I don't have enough to meet the need. That's fine. Give. Start with what you've got and see what happens. We have to put our trust in the Lord even when we see no sign of an answer. And when we act in obedience to his direction, trusting that he will provide all that is needed, we will not be disappointed and we will not be ashamed. That is his promise. The disciples could only see a few broken pieces of bread and fish in the bottom of their baskets. But they stepped out in faith and started to give away what they had and their baskets never emptied. So they never stopped giving until... Probably hours later, after they had distributed over 3,000 pounds of food to perhaps 15,000 people. And can you imagine their joy? Can you imagine their excitement? Can you imagine their sense of fulfillment? Being part of what God was doing. I'm I can't even imagine what they experienced. And verse 20 says, So they all ate and were filled, and they took up 12 baskets full of the fragments that remained. Now those who had eaten were about 5,000 men, besides women and children. Now these crowds of people, remember, were undeserving. They didn't really believe much of what Jesus was teaching. But that didn't stop him from having compassion upon them. That didn't stop him from healing their sick. That didn't stop him from feeding them when they were hungry. He sends his reign on the just and the unjust. He loves and cares for us all. 
He can do the same for you today. What is your need that you need him to minister to today? Hebrews 13 verse 8 says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He never changes. We have the same God. We have the same Lord. Our culture has changed. Our way of thinking has changed, but he hasn't changed. And we need to change our way of thinking, and we need to resist the influences of our culture that are counter to our faith in the Lord. Notice how many baskets of bread and fish were left over after everyone else had fed? Twelve. How many disciples were passing out the bread? Twelve. One full basket of food for each of the twelve disciples to keep for themselves. Not only did God use them to bless others, but in the process, as they gave what they had, it was returned to them, and they had more than they started with. Jesus taught this principle in Luke 6:38, give and it will be given to you, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be poured into your lap, for with the measure that you use, it will be measured to you. You give and it will come back to you, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, um, the measure you used plus. So the disciples didn't have enough to feed the people, they had only enough to feed maybe two or three. But when, in obedience to Christ's word, they trusted what they had to the Lord, he multiplied it and he enabled them to feed the multitude until the multitude was fully satisfied and there was enough left over for them to be fully satisfied. Jesus was training his disciples no longer for life in the kingdom, but for life on mission as the church. This is what he is training them for at this stage of his ministry. This illustrates something of our Lord's intention for the life of the church. We can't meet the needs of the world around us out of our resources, but we have been sent into a world that is full of need. And God wants us to minister to their needs. And he will do it through us, using what little we have. Give all that you have. Give all that you are to the Lord in obedience to his direction and see what he will do with you. Our Christianity is worthless if it does not motivate us to give all that we are and to give all that we have in faith and obedience to the word of our master. He says, go. Our response, yes, Lord, I will go. And my experience will be fulfilling. He says, give. I say, yes, Lord, I will give, and I will not lack. He says, heal. And I say, but Lord, I can't, but you can. And so I will, in obedience to you and in the name of Jesus, which you have authorized me to use, whatever he says, we say, yes, Lord, have your way in me. For I am your hands, I am your feet. We are the body of Christ, and you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so we will go and trust you to use us for your glory. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you that this is the kind of God that we follow, and the kind of God that we are invited to trust. Lord, deliver us from unbelief and deliver us from unhealthy skepticism. Deliver us, Lord, from cultural norms that have uh, been established against faith in you and dependence upon you. Deliver us from self-sufficiency. Deliver us from humanistic pride. 
and arrogance. But Lord, I pray that you would fill us with humble hearts that recognize we do not have what it takes, but you are all that is needed. And you live within us. And you are eager to express yourself through us if we would just yield to you and offer to you our bodies a living sacrifice. Oh, Lord God, I pray that this world would see and know Christ through your church as we trust you, as we follow you, and as we act in obedience to your prompting, your speaking, your word. And Father, I pray that we would have the joy and the fulfillment and just that praise-filled excitement over being used by you to minister to the needs of others. Lord, give us lives that are lived with purpose and lives that are filled with the joy of the Lord as you have your way in us. And I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.